Hello, everyone. I am back and I will be reading from chapter 13, the narrative of Mary Jem Jemison. Mrs. Jemison is informed that she has a cousin in the neighborhood by the name of George Jemison. His poverty, her kindness, his ingratitude, her trouble from land speculation, and her cousin moves off. A year or two before the death of my husband, Captain H. Jones sent me word that a cousin of mine was then living in Leicester, a few miles from Gardot, by the name of George Jemison, and he was very poor, thought it advisable for me to go and see him and take him home to live with me on my land. My Indian friends were pleased to hear that one of my relatives was so near and also advised me to send for him and his family immediately. I accordingly had him had him and his family moved into one of my houses in the month of March, 1810. He said that he was my father's brother's son, that his father did not leave Europe till after the French war in America, and that when he did come over, he had settled in Pennsylvania where he died. George had no personal knowledge of my father, but from information was confident that the relationship which he claimed between himself and me actually existed. Although I had never, never before heard of my father having had but one brother, him who was killed at Fort Necessity, yet I knew that he might have had others. And as the story of George carried with it a probability that it was true, I received him as a kinsman and treated him with every degree of friendship which his situation demanded. I found that he was destitute of the means of subsistence and in debt to the amount of $70 without the ability to pay one cent. He had no cow and finally he was completely poor. I paid his debts to the amount of $72 and bought him a cow for which I paid $20 and a sow and pigs that I paid $8 for. I also paid $16 for pork that I gave him and furnished him with other provisions and furniture so that his family was comfortable. As he was destitute of a team, I furnished him with one and also supplied him with the tools for farming. In addition to all of this, I let him have one of Thomas's cows for two seasons. My only object in mentioning his poverty and the articles with which I supplied him is to show how ungrateful a person can be for favors and how soon a kind benefactor will, to all appearance, be forgotten. Thus furnished with the necessary implements of husbandry, a good team, and as much land as he could till, he commenced farming on my flats and for some time labored well. At length, however, he got an idea that if he could become the owner of a part of my reservation, he could live more easily and certainly be more rich and accordingly set himself about laying a plan to obtain it in the easiest manner possible. I supported Jemison and his family eight years and probably should have continued to have done so to this day had it not been for the occurrence of the following circumstance. When he had lived with me six or seven years, a friend of mine told me that as Jemison was my cousin and very poor, I ought to give him a piece of land that he might have something whereon to live, that he would call his own. My friend and Jemison were then together at my house, prepared to complete a bargain. I asked how much land he wanted. Jemison said that he should be glad to receive his old field, as he called it, containing about 14 acres, and a new one that contained 26. I observed to them that I was incapable of transacting business of that nature. I would wait till Mr. Thomas Clue, a neighbor on whom I depended, should return from Albany before I should do anything about it. To this, Jemison replied that if I waited till Mr. Clute returned, he should get, not get the land at all and appeared very anxious to have the business closed without any delay. On my part, I felt disposed to give him some land, but knowing my ignorance of writing, feared to do it all alone, lest they might include as much land as they pleased without my knowledge. They then read the deed which my friend had prepared before he came from home, describing a piece of land by certain bounds that were a specified number of chains and links from each other. Not understanding the length of a chain or link, I described the bounds of a piece of land that I intended Jemison should have, which they said was just the same that the deed contained and no more. I told them that the deed must not include a lot that was called the steel place, and they assured me that it did not. 
Upon this, putting confidence in them both, I signed the deed to George Jemison, containing and conveying to him, as I supposed, 40 acres of land. The deed being completed, they charged me never to mention the bargain which I had then made to any person, because if I did, they said it would spoil the contract. The whole matter was afterward disclosed when it was found that the deed, instead of containing, containing only 40 acres, contained 400, and that one half of it actually belonged to my friend, as it had been given to him by Jemison as a reward for his trouble in procuring the deed in the fraudulent manner above mentioned. My friend, however, but, however, by the advice of some well-disposed people, af a while afterwards gave up his claim, but Jemison held his till, he sold it for a trifle to a gentleman in the south part of Genesee County. Sometime, sometime after the death of my son Thomas, one of his sons went to Jemison to get the old cow that I had let him have two years, but Jemison refused to let her go and struck the boy so violent a blow as to almost kill him. Jemison then run, ran to jealous Clute to procure a warrant to take the boy, but young King, an Indian chief, went down to Squawky Hill to Clute's and settled the affair by Jemison's agreeing never to use that club again. Having satisfactorily found out the friendly disposition of my cousin toward me, I got him off my premises as soon as possible. Chapter 14, another family affliction, her son John's occupation. He goes to Buffalo, returns, great slide by him considered ominous, trouble. He goes to Squawky Hill, quarrels, is murdered by two Indians, his funeral, mourners, his disposition, ominous dream, black chief's advice, his widows and family, his age, his murderers flee, her advice to them, they set out to leave their country, their uncle's speech to them on parting, they return, Jack proposes to doctor to kill each other, doctor's speech in reply, Jack's suicide, doctor's death. <clears throat> Trouble seldom comes single. When George Jemison was busily engaged in his pursuit of wealth at my expense, another event of much more serious nature occurred, which added greatly to my afflictions and consequently destroyed at least a part of the happiness that I had anticipated was laid up in the archives of Provid Providence to be dispensed by my old age. My son John was a doctor considerably celebrated among the Indians of various tribes for his skill in curing their diseases by the administration of roots and herbs, which he gathered in the forests and other places where they had been planted by the hand of nature. <clears throat> in the month of April or 1st of May, 1817, he, would, he was called upon to go to Buffalo, Cat Cataragus and Allegheny to cure some who were very sick. He went and was absent about two months. When he returned, he observed the great slide of the bank of Genesee River, a short distance above my house, which had taken place during his absence, and conceiving that circumstance to be ominous of his own death, called out his sister Nancy's, told her that he should live only but a few days, and wept bitterly at the near approach of his dissolution. Nancy endeavored to persuade him that his trouble was imaginary and that he ought not to be affected by a fancy which, just, which was just visionary. Her arguments were ineffectual and afforded no alleviation to his mental suffering. From his sisters, he went to his own house where he stayed only two nights and then he went to Squawky Hill to procure money with which to purchase flour for the use of his family. <clears throat> While at Squawky Hill, he got into the company of two Squawky Hill Indians, whose names were Doctor and Jack, with whom he drank freely, and in the afternoon had a desperate quarrel in which his opponents, as it was afterward understood, agreed to kill him. The quarrel ended, and each appeared to be friendly. John bought some spirits, of which they all drank, and then sat, set out for home. John and an Allegheny Indian were on horseback, and Doctor and Jack were on foot. It was dark when they set out. They had not proceeded far when Dr. and Jack commenced another quarrel with John, clenched and dragged him off his horse, and then with a stone gave him so severe a blow on his head that some of his brains were discharged from the wound. The Allegheny Indian, fearing that his turn would come next, fled for safety as fast as possible. 
John recovered a little from the shock he had received and endeavored to get to an old hut that stood near, but they caught him, and with an ax they cut his throat and beat out his brains so that when he was found, the contents of his skull were laying on his arms. Some squaws who heard the uproar ran to find out the cause of it, but before they had the time to offer any assistance, the murderers drove them into a house and threatened to take their lives if they did not stay there or if they were to make any noise. <clears throat> Next morning, Clute sent me word that John was dead and also informed me of the means by which his life was taken. A number of people went from Gardau to where the body lay and Dr. Levi Brundridge brought it up home where the funeral was attended after the manner of the white people. Mr. Benjamin Luther and Mr. William Wiles preached a sermon and performed the funeral services and myself and family followed the corpse to the grave as mourners. I had now buried my three sons who had been snatched from me by the hands of violence when I least expected it. Although Joan, John had taken the life of his two brothers and caused me unspeakable trouble and grief, his death made a solemn impression upon my mind and seemed, in addition to my former misfortunes, enough to bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Yet on a second thought, I could not mourn for him as I had for my other sons, because I knew that his death was just and what he had deserved for a long time from, from the hands of justice. John's vices were so great and so aggravated that I have nothing to say in his favor. Yet as a mother, I pitied him while he lived and have ever felt a great degree of sorrow for him because of his bad conduct. From his childhood, he carried something in his features indicative of an, e of an evil disposition that would result in the perpetration of enormities of some kind. And it was the opinion and saying of Ebenezer Allen that he would be a bad man and be guilty of some crime deserving of death. There's no doubt but what the thoughts of murder rankled in his breast and disturbed his mind even in his sleep, for he dreamt that he had killed Thomas for a trifling offense and thereby forfeited his own life. Alarmed at the revelation and fearing that he might in some unguarded moment destroy his brother, he went to the black chief to whom he told, told the dream and expressed his fears that the vision would be verified. Having related the dream together with his feelings on the subject, and he asked for the best advice that his old friend was capable of giving to prevent so sad an event. The black chief, with his usual promptitude, told him that from the nature of his dream, he was fearful that something serious would take place between him and Thomas, and he advised him by all means to govern his temper and to avoid any quarrel which in future he might see arising, especially if Thomas was a party. John, however, did not keep the good counsel of the chief, for soon after he killed Thomas, as I have related. John left two wives with whom he had lived at the same time and raised nine children. His widows are now living at Canadea with their father and keep their children, children with and near them. His children are tolerably white and have got light colored hair. John died about the last day of June, 1817, aged 54 years. Doctor and Jack, having finished their murderous design, fled before they could be apprehended and lay six weeks in the woods back of Canisteo. They then returned and sent me some wampum by Chongo, my son-in-law, and Sungiwa, that is Big Kettle, expecting that I would pardon them and suffer them to live as they had done with their tribe. I, however, would not accept their wampum, but returned it with a request that rather than have them killed, they would run away and keep out of danger. On their receiving back the wampum, they took my advice and prepared to leave their country and people immediately. Their relatives accompanied them a short distance on their journey, and when about to part, their old uncle, the tall chief, addressed them in the following pathetic and sentimental speech. Friends, hear my voice. When the great spirit made Indians, he made them all good and gave them good cornfields, good rivers, well stored with fish, good forests filled with game and good bows and arrows. But very soon each wanted more than his share and Indians quarreled with Indians and some were killed and others were wounded. Then the great spirit made a very good word and put it in every Indian's breast to tell us when we have done good, or when we have done bad, and that word has never told a lie. 
friends, whenever you have stole or gotten drunk or lied, that good word has told you that you were bad Indians and made you afraid of good Indians and made you ashamed and looked down. Friends, your crime is greater than all those. You have killed an Indian in a time of peace and made the wind hear his groans and the earth drink his blood. You are bad Indians. Yes, you are very bad Indians, and what can you do? If you go into the woods to live alone, the ghost of John Jemison will follow you, crying blood, blood, and will give you no peace. If you go to the land of your nation, there that ghost will attend you and say to your relatives, see my murderers. If you plant, it will blast your corn. If you hunt, it will scare your game. And when you are asleep, its groans and the sight of an avenging tomahawk will awake you. What can you do? Deserving of death, you cannot live here. And to fly from your country, to leave all of your relatives, and to abandon all that you have known to be pleasant and dear must be keener than an arrow, more bitter than gall, more terrible than death. And how must we feel? Your path will be muddy, the woods will be dark, the lightnings will glance down the trees by your side, and you will start at every sound. Peace has left you, and you must be wretched. Friends, hear me and take my advice. Return with us to your homes. Offer to the great spirit your best wampum and try to be good Indians. And if those whom you have bereaved shall claim your lives as their only satisfaction, surrender, surrender them cheerfully and die like good Indians. And here Jack, highly incensed, interrupted the old man and bade him to stop speaking or he would take his life. Affrighted at the appearance of so much desperation, the company hastened toward home and left Doctor and Jack to consult their own feelings. As soon as they were alone, Jack said to Doctor, I'd rather die here than leave my country and friends. Put the muzzle of your rifle into my mouth and I will put the muzzle of my rifle into yours and at a given signal we'll discharge them and rid ourselves all at once of the troubles under which we now labor and satisfy the claims which justice holds against us. <clears throat> Doctor heard the proposition and after a moment's pause made the following reply. I am as sensible as you can be of the unhappy situation in, in which we have placed ourselves. We are bad Indians. We have forfeited our lives and must expect in some way to atone for our crime. But because we are bad and miserable, shall we make ourselves worse? If we were now innocent and in a calm reflecting moment should kill ourselves, that act would make us bad and deprive us of our share of the good hunting in the land where our fathers have gone. gone. What would Little Beard say to us on our arrival at his cabin? He would say, bad Indians, cowards, you were afraid to wait till we wanted your help. Go to where snakes will lie in your path, where the panthers will starve you by devouring the venison and where you will be naked and you, were, you will suffer with the cold. Go, none but the brave and the good Indians live here. I cannot think of performing an act that will add to my wretchedness. It is hard enough for me to suffer here and have good hunting hereafter, worse to lose the whole. Upon this, Jack withdrew his proposal. They went on about two miles and then turned about and came home. Guilty and uneasy, they lurked about Squawky Hill nearly a fortnight, and then went to Cataragus and were, sick, were gone six weeks. When they came back, Jack's wife earnest, earnestly requested him to remove his family to Tonawanta, but he remonstrated against her project and utterly declined going. His wife and family, however, tired of the tumult by which they were surrounded, packed up their effects in spite of what he could say, and they went off. Jack deliberated a short time upon the proper course for himself to pursue, and finally, rather than leave his old home, he ate a large quantity of muskrat, muskrat root and died in 10 to 12 hours. His family being immediately notified of his death, he retur re returned to attend the burial, and yet living, they are at Squawky Hill. Nothing was ever done with Doctor, who continued to live quietly at Squawky Hill to, till sometime in the year 1819, when he died of the consumption. So those are the two chapters I 
I will share with you for today. And if you come back tomorrow, we will conclude the narrative of Mary Jemison. I thank you for tuning in and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.